Mr. Bueller, still good morning. Good morning, Your Honor, and may it please the Court. I would like to start, if I may, where the Superior Court ended this case, and that's on the issue of public policy in relation to suicide prevention at Massachusetts colleges and universities. Contrary to the Superior Court's ultimate conclusion, Massachusetts public policy does not and should not sanction individual and inst institutional actions that result in the suicide of a student. In addition to the statutory references in the briefs, there are three other statutes I'd like to bring to the Court's attention that make it clear that in various situations of life in the Commonwealth, that suicide can and should be prevented where possible. For example, General Laws Chapter 71, Section 95 requires suicide awareness and prevention training in all public school districts in Massachusetts. General Laws Chapter 40, Section 36C requires all Massachusetts police to receive training in suicide detection, intervention, and prevention. General Laws Chapter 112, Section 5N requires the Board of Registration and Medicine to make suicide prevention training modules available to physicians. Okay. None of these statutes are directly applicable to this case. Counsel, sure. I understand what you're saying, that, that, that there's a strong public policy argument in terms of preventing suicide. Um, but assuming there is such a duty with the school and the student, what would fulfillment of that duty have looked like in this instance? In this case? Yes. They could have fulfilled that duty as explained by one of our experts at tab 189B of volume 8, Your Honor, who goes into four discrete points in time when proper interventions by the folks at MIT could have prevented this. In 2007, when this young man was in the grips of MIT Student Support Services and Mental Health Departments, they could have done exactly what they said in writing they were going to do, which is stay in touch in connection with this student, follow up with him as they should have done. They could have communicated with the people who were dealing with him in his department and provided them the guidance that they needed. That was their role. They said they were going to do that. They said, we're going to stay in touch in connection with this student. 2007, they had him, and they dropped him. But don't they, have to respect, don't they have to respect some of his personal choices, too, which is to not be treated by their mental health professionals, but rather he chooses his own mental health professionals to take care of him, right? Your Honor, they, they in fact... And he has eight or nine different um, psychologists and psychiatrists seeing him? The record reflects that this was a young man who was motivated to get help. The answer to that question is yes. He was seeking some of the best treatment he could get. And what has happened during the course of this case is that has been twisted from, I would suggest, a positive thing to a bad thing. I, no, I think it's a, a, a great thing. But I guess the question is, the follow-up question to that is, none of those people thought there was an imminent risk of suicide either, right? Uh, Your Honor, the imminent risk argument made in this case is one of the most dangerous aspects of this case, and here's why. I, I just want to just understand factually. None, none of the psychiatrists and psychologists who were treating him thought he was in danger enough for them to take action, right? Imminent risk, as used by those physicians, relates to when they would have hit the point where they would have thought they needed to involuntarily commit this person. What they, the defendants, are trying to do is take that medical standard and import it into what they're doing when they have a very real knowledge of a serious and material suicide risk that the record in this case indicates they in fact responded to because so they are, thought are it was so serious. Are you suggesting that there's a difference between imminent and serious in oh. this context? I am suggesting that there's a difference between the standard that would trigger an involuntary commitment by a medical prof professional and what, and what should trigger a telephone call from a concerned department head down to the professionals who can actually properly address a student who's having these types of issues. That's, that, I would suggest, is a very big difference. And I would suggest that important, importing that imminent risk standard into a duty of care is going to wipe out protections for really the large percentage of these students who are at risk. Because statistically, most of the students who are at risk at these schools are not easy cases like Han Wen's case was. He was well known to this school to be, be at risk of student suicide. The vast majority of them are not known and they're trying to draw those people in. And if you say to the schools, 
You don't need to use reasonable care, except during what would be a imminent suicide crisis, a kid standing on the side of the building saying, I'm gonna throw off or jump off. What you do is you miss the opportunities that these schools have to intercede earlier in the process, which is when you can save these students. So let's just assume that if there's a duty, it's not the same duty as a, for somebody to pink paper some, uh, an individual. Just, just assume that. If there's a duty, it can't be that. But 25-year-old um, adults have um, a, a right to have their own personal integrity. They have a right to their own autonomy. They have a right not to have, um, uh, to go to the psychologist that they want to go to, or not to have the school uh, calling the parents or professors calling uh, psychologists at the school. And, and we've got all sorts of cases in, in, in Massachusetts in federal court. Uh, Judge Saylor uh, uh, had a case, I think, in 2011 uh, dealing with uh, actually a sexual assault at MIT involving an Emerson student. We are, there's, 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 these are adults. How does the duty of care run to these adults without um, uh, disrespecting their right to personal autonomy? To understand from the record in this case, Your Honor, that um, Han Wen signed a couple of forms like most students do when he went to the school. And it said, in the case of an emergency, contact his parents. He also, his last contact with the folks at Student Support Services were to thank them for their efforts and indicate he'd be willing to use their services if they could be offering a certain type of um, services. His last contact with MIT Mental Health was that to thank them for their help thus far. The record properly construed would indicate that this young man would have taken guidance from MIT Student Support Services network broadly viewed and would have done what they told him to do. They told him to go to DSO, he went. They told him to go to mental health, he went. Student support services, he went. They modified his exam schedule, he did what they asked him to do. They modified his oral exam schedule, he, he did what they asked him to do. They conditionally passed him, he met those conditions. If they had said that it's part of what's going on here because we're aware of a serious risk of suicide, and on this record, there's no dispute that they were aware of that given the January of 2009 meeting, this young man would have done what they told him to do. Now, would have that marginally I'm, I'm invaded this young man's right if he had told them, as they alleged, I want nothing to do with you, I want nothing to do with this, uh, with your systems, maybe it would have, but he never said that to them, but not on this record. But, but causation doesn't matter if there's no duty. So you're telling me that there would be a causation issue if there's a breach of a duty. We have to find out there's a duty before you get to causation. That's correct, Your Honor, and, you do. And how would you define that duty? Your, Your Honor, I think defining the duty of care in this situation as anything other than a duty of reasonable care under the circumstances would be a very big mistake. Okay, so you're, you're, you're saying there's a duty of reasonable care by his faculty advisor and the dean of his, of his program to do what, given that they know he's doing poorly academically and has mental health issues? In 2008, instead of sending the email to a colleague saying we believe he's at risk and we've pretty much decided to pass him no matter what, reach out at the same time to the folks at MIT Mental Health and Student Support but, but Services they, But just, just clarify though, so in 2007, they send him to the mental health unit, right? They, they, do, they do refer they him to that. They refer him to that. Then right. they, he says, look, I wanna keep my mental health world and my academic world separate right? He says that to them, right? He doesn't want people to think that he's, you know, got mental health issues at school because he's trying to keep his academic life and his mental health issues he, compartmentalized. He, he, he does, in fact, express that, Your Honor. That is part of the record. So what do they do? I'm just trying to understand their duty because, again, you're talking about some, the last time they have that conversation is 2007. He commits suicide in 2009, right? Two, year, two years later? That's correct. So what are they supposed to do? He's asked them to respect his personal autonomy, um, and he's, they know he's getting very high-quality care. At least they know he's at Mass General. He's, you know, he's 
getting a lot of psychiatric and psychological support, what else should they do? The, the problem with the lack of coordination between his outside care and what was going on at MIT. But he doesn't want them to communicate. They even try to, and he doesn't authorize the further communication, right? Well, actually, they didn't need the authority to communicate outward, which is why Dan Dean Randall made the contact with but the they, but they couldn't profession. get. But they couldn't get his psychiatrist says, I can't speak to you because he hasn't given permission, right? One, one of the things that many schools have done, or some schools at least have done in this type of situation, is require that as a continued condition of matriculation, the students in this situation authorize that type of communication. If you want to be a in, Meaning that the, the school would have to give them a choice. If you want to keep attending MIT, you have to meet with our psychiatrists? That's, that's part of the duty? That is, Your Honor, one of the ways one of the colleges that is referenced in the materials in the record has addressed this issue because they understood with their suicide statistics that that represented reason, reasonable care under the circumstances. And that's why it's so important that the court adopt that flexible, universal, common law standard that can be applied differently at these institutions. Each one of them has a different risk profile relative to the suicide losses at the schools. And each one of these students who is, who is at risk presents their own individual suicide profile. And the beauty of the reasonable care standard, which by the way applies everywhere else without any type of blips or problems, and which by the way, the University of Amici said essentially they were doing anyway back in the amicus brief they filed in the Shin case, even though they admitted that here. That universal standard of reasonable care under the circumstances addresses the broader issues at these schools so they can catch the most kids and save them. Because the statistics are if they do this, they will save them. And in connection with the individual who they know to be at risk like this young man, if that kid's at imminent risk and they have the time to do something, sure, they can be more aggressive. If he's less than that imminent risk where he's standing on the edge saying, I'm going to jump, they can address that less serious risk reasonably as well, too. They didn't do that here. Instead, what they did was they allowed untrained PhDs in marketing to manage a known suicide risk. Well, they didn't, they were managing his academic life. That's, they they weren't managing his mental health life because, again, he had his private psychiatrists and psychologists weighing in on that. I mean, they can't, I mean, you don't want that faculty advisor calling his psychiatrist, right? Your Honor, I wanted that faculty advisor calling MIT's own in-house people who were there to deal with these problems. And you're right that the- Which, you want him, them to call S3, S cubed, or you want them to call what, who? Um, well, um, me mental health at MIT is where the uh, students develop a clinician phys uh, patient relationship. S cubed is where they I actually are designed, the they're designed so they can actually, under the uh, exempt exemptions to the privacy rules, you can actually have communication between mental health and S cubed, and then from S cubed, you can have communication to whoever you want about these risks. That's the system they have set up at MIT to deal with these issues. And all of these people we're talking about, his professors who are managing this risk when they shouldn't have been, are all part of that broader student support services network over there. And that's not me saying that. That's their mental health task force who defines their program that way. Phil Clay, the chancellor of the institute, testified that the obligation of any MIT employee when they became aware that a student was at risk of suicide was to contact mental health or S cubed. That didn't happen here, not just by the named defendants, but by all of the faculty members who were at that meeting in, in January. And I understand that the defendant's argument relative to, um, well, I'm gonna skip that point. The, the public uh, policy uh, aspects of this case, I think, cannot be overstated. I think that the, the law, the statutes I just mentioned, indicate that there has been a profound sea change in thinking relative to suicide and suicidality. This is something that can be prevented. No longer in this society are suicide victims viewed as immoral. Is this viewed as unpreventable? In 2012, the uh, Surgeon General issued an update, 2012 National Strategy for Suicide Prevention. It has a timeline in it that indicates that national efforts on this issue have gone back to 1960, pretty much since Bogus versus Iverson was decided. And what they make clear is the thinking has changed. 
This is something preventable if it's handled appropriately. Schools like University of Illinois have fixed this problem. If, 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 if a school, if a university has a duty to its adult students, who else would have a similar duty? Would an employer have a similar duty? Do, do, do parents, can parents be sued if they fail to exercise reasonable care to prevent a suicide? protect that individual from the risk of suicide? I would suggest that they are doing exactly what this case said, or what this court said in Mullins, which is that they will use reasonable care to protect their students from foreseeable, foreseeable risks. But the, the, the difference, though, is that it's a lot easier to understand what the police in a campus should do with regard to that type of security. You gotta secure the dorm. It's a lot easier to figure out what to do uh, than it is here. Your Honor, I would suggest that it is, is, is as easy to understand that when you've been warning others for more than a year of a known risk of suicide on a particular student, that you don't pick up the phone and read them the riot act. But I mean, but what, what, what percentage of students do you think at MIT or comparable institutions have had suicidal ideations during the course of the year? I would think it's in the ballpark of 10%, and it's, that may be an underestimate. Su suicidal ideations, Your Honor, the statistics I'm aware of would put it actually higher than that. But suicidal ideation isn't what we're talking about here. We're talking about walking around and actually talking about suicide. Uh, we're talking about voicing the intent. We're talking about prior uh, two su suicide attempts that were known. When you look at the risk factors, those two prior attempts are the single biggest indicators of a future attempt. This was a kid who was walking around, or a young man who was walking around with bells and whistles on this issue. This should have been an easy case for them to properly address. And it, all it really required was that a different phone call be made, either in 2007, 2008, or 2009, on June 2, 2009. Pick up the phone, call in the supports that are there, that are paid to be there. And this young man is alive. And he certainly doesn't die the way he did, because by all accounts, based on this record, which I would suggest was improperly construed, in many ways as evidenced in a brief by the Superior Court, he was minding his own business in a different lab working on his uh, PhD program when that call came through, which resulted in a commotion, him rushing up the stairs, rushing past this elevator security or elevator repair guy who had a terrible day himself because he got to see this young man go right off the roof of that building. None of that happens. If their programs that were in place had a work they were designed, or had a work that were the the way they were designed to work, and more importantly, if they had done what they said they were gonna do previously, which is have faculty training and also, um, well, have faculty training and have what's known as a handoff policy. And just as one last point, if I may, in the record, there is a Harvard Health Policy Review article. It was written by the former head and the former deputy head of MIT Mental Health, as well as, uh, as well as one of the fellows who used to work over at Harvard, as well as members of the me medical department or mental health department from a number of the meat guy who were here supporting MIT's position. Take a look at that. These folks know this environment. They know where the holes are. They know where the problems are. The arguments they make are the same ones I'm making here, and I have no trouble telling this court that the reason for that is most of what we're saying from comes from them comes from MIT's mental health people who know what needs to be done. And if this court enters an order reaffirming the simple proposition that these schools are not treated uniquely, they're, not, they're no different than any other actor that has uh, resources, if they go ahead and are subject to an unquestioned duty of reasonable care, either as a matter of basic common law or a special relationship with their students, which section 40 of the restatement third indicates they clearly have, Can I ask these kids will be safer. Are there any cases, the cases, I, I read a number of the cases you cite in the brief, the only cases that seem to find a duty are ones where there is an imminent 
risk of suicide. Um, are you, is there any case out there like this one where the duty is found short of that? Um, and in which case is it? Because I, I read all the ones you cited. I didn't see, I mean, the cases are kids who've committed suicide, they've told people they're about to, um, the police officers are dropping them off somewhere and then they don't follow up. Nothing like this, um, except for possibly Shin, but Shin's not a, a appellate case. Uh, that, that's true, Your Honor, and I had the privilege of working closely with David DeLuca on Shin, who's here in the courtroom with us here today. This case is stronger than Shin ever thought of being, and candidly stronger than all the cases well, that were cited in the brief sh because... Sh Shin's younger. She's, a, she's 18 or 19. She's living in the dorm. She's told someone she's about to commit suicide, right? Uh, yes, Your Honor. And uh, here we don't have anything close in time, anything like that, and... This, this gentleman's 25 and not living in a dorm, right? And not being treated by MIT's health people. It's different than Shin, isn't it? Uh, there, there are substantial differences between this case and Shin, but relative to the final act, the actual cause of the incident, there's never before been a case like this, Your Honor, where the evidence supports the finding, and certainly in a summary judgment standard supports the finding, that the final telephone call with Berger Wernerfeld actually caused this young man, or caused this young, young man's suicide. You have active misfeasance here that causes a death. It's just, stronger than those I'm other cases. I'm just looking for the best case for duty for you. Which one should we look uh, at? I think you can start and begin your analysis in this case with Mullins versus Pine Manor, and if you want to look at another one, look at Delaney. But the part which of is, which Delaney is that the one you're saying? Delaney, Delaney versus Reynolds, Your Honor. But if you look at Mullins, there's a section of Mullins that talks about um, if anything is to be done here, the schools have got to act. Because no student, to channel Mullins for a minute, yeah, but has- Mo Mullins is a case in which it's a, a student is raped on campus and there are deficiencies in the security apparatus of the school, right? And, That's and the undergraduates have to live in, at, on campus. All correct. And Lisa Mullins was a uh, random victim of a generalized risk. Here there was a particularized victim of a, of a generalized risk that they knew about for more than two years. And as in Mullins, if anything is to be done, not only in relation to this issue and whether or not I get to try this in front of a jury, but in connection with all the other students who are at risk, the only, thing, the only way that something important is going to happen here is if the colleges themselves take on a responsibility to do the things that are necessary. Put in place what Phil Clay said this young man was entitled to, a properly coordinated student support group of services. Do what Dr. Barnes said she often did in connection with other students, which is even if there's resistance from the students, which I would suggest to the court is, according to the record in this case, common. Happens all the time. The students don't want to be involved in this process. They will lie. They will make stuff up. They'll do whatever they can to get out of it. But the prudent schools make sure that they follow up and do what is appropriate to keep these students in the system, because if they keep them in the system, they keep them alive. But Mullins, I would suggest you can take that paragraph from Mullins. Take out this, the facts about rape or all those case-specific facts, and the rationale from Mullins can be directly applied to this case. All right. All right. Thank you. I think your time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Martin, good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, Kevin Martin, uh, for the defendants, and with me today I have Yvonne Chan. Your Honors, I'd like to start this case by recentering it on uh, Han Nguyen, and because this case really is about the autonomy and privacy that he expected and demanded um, during his life and during his last few years at MIT. Students these days quite reasonably expect that the decisions they make about their own uh, medical treatment, including mental health treatment, will be respected by their universities. In this case, and it's important to, to really focus on the, the, the record here, in 2007, MIT did exactly what plaintiffs say MIT should have done. They, they listened to a student who was having issues and they tried to help him. First, they tried sending him to student disability services and he said, I'm not disabled. He didn't want to work with student disability services. He then went to um, mental health services. And what did he tell mental health services? He said, I'm already seeing somebody off campus. I don't want to work with mental health services. He then spoke with Dean Randall at, at S, uh, S Cubed. What did he tell Dean Randall? Um, in a letter, in, in writing, he said, uh, I'm seeing somebody off campus. I don't want you to talk to them. I'm withdrawing the permission I previously gave you. Please don't talk to my off-campus 
I, I know you, you, you argue in your brief that foreseeability isn't the end all, correct? That's oh. correct, Your Honor. All right, but on, on foreseeability grounds, how do you get past the blood on our hands um, comment? Well, two, two points here, Your Honor. Um, first, foreseeability only matters if there's a duty. And ultimately here, we're talking about bystander liability. And foreseeability does not impose a, a duty on bystanders. But, uh, are you going to concede that it was foreseeable because of the blood on the hands? Um, well, no, Your Honor. We, we certainly don't concede that either. Um, then how do you reconcile that? Well, the, the professor who made that statement was a marketing professor. He was not someone trained in recognizing when um, a risk of suicide is foreseeable. All of the actual experts, the off-campus treating physicians who were working with uh, Han Nguyen, did not think it was foreseeable that he would be committing suicide. And I would note, too, there are, there are two layers to the, to the issue of foreseeability. There's kind of general foreseeability. Um, and Chief Justice Gantz, you, you quite rightly raised the question of how many students on campus um, may have suicidal ideation. Um, there's some evidence in the record that some, some, at, a, at a typical university, somewhere between 16 and 18 percent of the students will consult uh, mental health services in, in a given year. Um, so there are a lot of students with mental health issues on campus, and you, you cannot suggest that because all of those students have mental health issues, um, it's foreseeable that they'll all commit suicide. With respect to the, the particular events which plaintiff alleges caused the suicide in this instance, the final telephone call, it also was not foreseeable that that call would result in Mr. Wynn taking his own life. Certainly they'd had conversations with him before um, about his manner of interacting with people and also about his future in the academy. Uh, in fact, only a few months earlier, there was an email exchange in which Mr. Wynn acknowledged that he was getting a message that maybe he wasn't cut out for a PhD program and he should simply stop with a master's. Um, that did not result in any kind of acute um, mental health crisis. I want to correct the record, too. Um, before, my, you my leave, brother, before you leave Justice Gassiano's question, though, we've collapsed duty and foreseeability in Massachusetts sometimes, right? We don't, if it's foreseeable, we, we haven't spent a huge amount of time dividing duty from foreseeability. That's yeah. certainly correct, Your Honor, with respect to the consequences of one's own actions. Mm -hmm. um, however, again, with, with bystander liability, which is what we're talking about here, mm -hmm. um, foreseeability does not give rise to any kind of duty to intervene. That, that assumes that we, don't, we, we, we reject the Mullins argument. Um, that, that would and assume you reject the, the Mullins The university argument, is not a bystander if we accept the plaintiff's uh, Mullins argument. That's correct, Your Honor. When you have a special, a special duty as a result of your relationship, you do have some duty to intervene. Um, however, the, the Mullins case is all about the dependence that the student had on the university for her physical security while on campus. And if you look more broadly at the types of special relationships that the law has recognized, they, they all, whether it's landlord-tenant or innkeeper guest, they, they all really have to do with the fact that when you're on someone else's property, you're dependent upon them for your security against whether it's the, the criminal acts of third parties, natural disasters. Or a police officer pulls over a drunk driver. Um, or a police officer pulls over a drunk driver. There's a, a duty to third parties with whom that, that drunk driver may get into an accident. But there's not a duty to the drunk driver himself. And no court has recognized a special relationship duty to protect somebody from their own self-inflicted harm. Uh, the society does not expect, for example, a landlord to protect a tenant from committing suicide in their own apartment building. They don't expect an there, innkeeper to there, protect a guest. He's presented some out-of-state cases where, like, I mean, even like, there's a university where the, the woman's suicidal and the police officers don't sort of supervise the handoff of her, right? I can't remember if it's Wisconsin or somewhere. But there are some cases out there that have created a duty. Those are generally, um, Your Honor, cases involving somebody in, either in custody or recently released from custody. Mm -hmm. And you know, th this court in the Slavin case has recognized that custody is a special type of um, circumstance. However, none of these cases, and we cite in our brief several cases that have considered whether the relationship between, a between any kind of school, actually, even elementary and high schools, um, and their students gives rise to a general duty to protect somebody from self-inflicted harm. And those courts have all, have all answered the question, no. Um, unless you have something like a custody situation or unless you have actual medical professionals on campus treating the student, in which case there's a medical uh, duty of care which, which applies. Right, but uh, uh, it's hard to fit this into Pine Manor or, or reconcile it with that 
Panagakis versus uh, Walsh case with the uh, adults giving another adult alcohol and getting them into a bar with a fake ID. But it seems to me what the appellants are actually saying is that um, uh, the, the concern is, is so great here that we should pivot infusing normative values into what the duty of care is in this situation uh, and pivot away from those cases, pivot away from the limits of, uh, of Pine Manor. And, and so why aren't they right that because of the special circumstances here, we should pivot away from our previous doctrinal framework? Yeah, you know, the, the reason they're wrong, Your Honor, is that unlike the, the Pine Manor or, or all of these other special relationships, um, there's not dependence in the situation. And this case is actually a great example of that because Mr. Wynn was receiving care not from on-campus treating physicians. He had available to him the, the full resources of the hospitals in this area, and he took full advantage of those resources. Uh, so again, unlike every other situation where you have that, that element of dependence, you don't have it here. Nor do you have, to correct the record, a student, as my brother suggested, walking around campus broadcasting that he was about to commit suicide. At no point during his years at MIT did this um, student. And why did the professor, albeit a marketing professor, say that we're going to have blood on our hands? Your Honor, it's, it's not in the record, and um, there's some redacted testimony. It's, it's, we, we, we don't know um, for, per, for these purposes. What that, we do, that what we do that know that is that it's not because Han Wynn said to him, I'm thinking of committing suicide. That's undisputed, that there was never a, su a threat of suicide when but he didn't, was on did, campus. Didn't Mr. Randall communicate to uh, Dr. Wenderland that he, there were there were two suicidal incidents. I thought he did communicate. I thought that professor was actually informed of that. Am I misremembering Let the record? Let me check the record on that, Your Honor. Yeah, I, I, we'll get back from what I understand that. is that Randall did communicate with Wenderland. Um, he may have known that there were two incidents, uh, which Mr. Wynn described as not very serious incidents, years in the past when he was at, uh, M at Stanford. Right. However, there was never a suicide threat made by Mr. Wynn when he was on campus at MIT. Uh, and that's why for three, for three years, every single record of a appointment that Mr. Wynn had with his off-campus treating physicians states, you know, no, no current plan to commit suicide. Uh, nobody viewed this, this student as posing an, any kind of imminent risk. Is that where you would define the, the limit of the duty is knowledge of, um, I asked your brother what the duty is in your view. Is it? I mean, if, if you have a knowledge that someone is about to commit suicide in the dorm, I take it you have a duty to act there. Well, Your Honor, every court to have considered that, including courts applying the special relationship framework, has answered it no. Uh, that's the Jane case, for example. So if the uh, RA Iowa. finds out that someone has, has strung up a rope and is walking away, they, they can just walk away and have no liability? You can't, meet, you can't possibly argue that. Your Honor, every university has policies in place to protect its students. Right? They will do this rather, whether a court recognizes a duty in, in tort or not. But, but the question... The question is whether there's, there's tort liability right. here. The, the question, though, going to Justice Gaziano's point, is if there's no duty of care, no matter what the complaint says, no matter how horrendous the facts, the motion to dismiss will be granted. That, that's correct, Your Honor. So uh, under, under, under your argument, there is no factual scenario, even Justice Gaziano's, that would provide any duty of care on the part of a university. There are two possible exceptions to that, Your Honor, and it depends upon how the court views the concepts of custody and a voluntarily assumed duty. So if, for example, a student is required to live, to live in a dorm, right, and in a sense there's, there's custody of the, the student, it could be that under circumstances where the person is isolated from others who may help them, um, then there, there is a duty. But that would be viewing things as, as a custody situation. That is not the case with a 25-year-old graduate student who's living off campus. Well, I mean, I'm... It, okay. Go back to the RA hypothetical, as, 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 as stark as it may be. You're saying under that scenario, there'd be no liability, be no duty of care. The, 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 those are the facts, essentially, of the Jane case in which the Supreme Court of Iowa said there is not liability here for what happened, uh, in which they actually saw the student with the moped to get exhaust fumes into the dorm room. Um, they, they tried to help, but at the end of the day, the, the answer by the court was there, there was no duty here uh, as a result of the special relationship because the, this is self-inflicted harm. 
and unless the court is going to depart from bystander liability solely in the case of universities, then you would be opening the door. And I, I believe one of your honors- We should treat the RA like a bystander. The RA in that instance is a bystander unless there's some, you know, again, either, either unless you either conceptualize that as custody, um, which other courts have not done, or unless you view it as a voluntarily assumed duty. But the problem, of course, with a voluntarily assumed duty is you need to either show an increase in risk as a result of, the, of, of what was done, that, that things would have been better if the RA had done nothing. Um, but, so that's not what we're talking but about. But the Jane case- Or if you show dependence. Jane case applies that voluntarily assumed duty issue, but that other courts have gone to find the duty differently. So you're really suggesting that there's no, even in the context where there's all kinds of discussions about how great the mental health facilities are here and the coordination of care um, and the fact that at least with MIT, we've got a history of problems that they're actively addressing, they still wouldn't have a duty if, if they knew that some kid had just, some, the roommate calls up the RA and says, this kid sa is saying he's about to commit suicide. Um, they wouldn't have a duty to come in and prevent that? Uh, if, if, again, if you, if you know somebody is on the verge of committing suicide, you can, you can have, I believe someone called it the pink sheet, right? You, you can voluntarily um, put somebody um, in custody, or involuntarily put somebody in custody. That's certainly not the facts of. I understand. Of this case. That's, we're trying to define whether whether there is a duty in the scope of that duty, and right. your co your brother is saying that imminent risk of suicide is not enough, and you're saying imminent risk of suicide um, is. It's is, tricky, right? He you wants have, to go further, have... and you want to say there's no duty, uh, and I'm just trying to figure out whether there's some. For, there for, is a duty somewhere out there. For purposes of the hypothetical, Your Honor, it's not clear whether that student has already told the university, I'm receiving help off campus and I don't want to talk about my mental health issues with you. Mm -hmm. um, if you make it like the facts of this case where somebody has affirmatively said, I am not relying upon you, and in fact, in writing said, please don't talk to me about, about my mental health, then I think there's certainly no duty. Because that goes back to the expectations that students have in their privacy and autonomy rights. Um, if that student has not previously said, uh, I do not want to talk to you about mental health, um, and so it's, it's, there's an opening there, then perhaps um, there, there's a responsibility on the university and the university staff to at least try in that first instance where the person is, is imminently about to commit suicide to, to intervene. Um, however, if, if all you have is what you have in this case, which is a, which is a student saying, you know, I have test-taking anxiety, I have insomnia, there's never a threat during three years of suicide. You have experts actually working with a student, none of whom think the student poses a real suicide risk. Then I, it, a university should not begin treating the student against their will as if they pose a constant suicide threat. And if you look at the expert report that my brother referenced, which talks about the four intervention points, all of those intervention points are points at which uh, the Mr. Wynn told the university, I do not want to be treated by you as a mental health patient. I want to be treated like any other student. Um, you know, one, of the, one of the ideas they had was that before delivering the message to Mr. Wynn that his email was inappropriate, they had to get somebody from MIT Mental Health to go there and sit there with them while they delivered to, Mr. to Mr. Wynn what was fundamentally a work-related and academic um, uh, message. That was exactly what Mr. Wynn himself did not want. And the problem we have with this case, and the way that plaintiffs are approaching this case, is that Mr. Wynn's estate is effectively asking for a duty to be imposed, which is contrary to what Mr. Wynn himself, when he was alive, told the university he wanted, which was just to be treated like everybody else, and not to have all of his academic problems treated as mental health issues. I just want to make sure I understand. Is it your position that you prevail only if there is no duty of care, period? Or are you saying, arguably, there could be a duty of care, but the duty of care on these facts was not triggered? We went on either formulation, Your Honor. So there's, we would concede, and I think we do in our brief, that there are some circumstances under which a university does owe a duty of care to its students. So for example, if they take them into custody, or if they're offering um, actual mental health care treatment to a student who, who asks for it and does not turn it away. Um, so there, there are duties, 
but we none of them apply to the facts of this case. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor.